Now, you have seen last time that the skull can be viewed from different aspects, normal verticalis, normal lateralis and the normal frontalis are different view. Now, today I will take up the soft tissues on the top of the skull. That region is termed as scalp. Now, scalp is a region where we visualize the top view of the skull and this has got the bony framework as you have seen earlier. This was the norma verticalis and here you have seen that here was a coronal suture on the back side of the frontal bone and with the anterior borders of the parietal. Here is the region of the sagittal suture in the midline and posteriorly there is a point called lambda and from here the lambdoid suture was seen. The lambdoid suture is between the uh, squamous part of the occipital. So this will be the base for the region of the scalp. Now this will consist of the different layers and the layers of the scalp can be remembered by the uh, words this has got these letters in it and you can remember the layers of the scalp by its spelling. The S stands for the skin. So the su most superficial portion will be the skin. Deep to the skin of the scalp region, there will be the connective tissue. And the connective tissue will comprise of certain uh, compartments and these compartments will be containing the blood vessels and the nerves because the outer layer of the blood vessels will be connected with the connective tissue. The letter A stands for the aponeurosis of a muscle which is running between the frontal bone and the occipital bone. Aponeurosis of a muscle which is termed as fronto-occipitalis. Fronto-occipitalis. This is referred according to some people as occipitofrontalis because its origin is from the occipital bone and it runs forwards over the frontal region. So fronto-occipitalis or occipitofrontalis is the same. So the epidermis of this muscle is the third layer in the region of the scalp. The letter L stands for loose areolar tissue. The loose areolar tissue separates the, the aponeurosis and this separates the aponeurosis of this from the underlying layer which covers the bones of the coming in the region of the scalp and that is the periosteal layer. But since it is covering the cranium, this periosteum covering these bones is termed as pericranium. Pericranium. Peri means around cranium for the cranial bones. So the portion of the scalp has got these five layers. Most superficial is the skin. Deep to the skin is connective tissue. Deeper to the connective tissue 
lies the apotheosis of the frontooccipital muscle, the loose areal tissue, and the pericranium. Now these layers, when we dissect the first three layers, that means the skin, connective tissue, and the aponeurosis, they form a single layer, and surgically, therefore, the scalp will consist of only three layers because the first three layers from the superficial to the deep side, they are almost fused with each other. Now, over this occipital bone, when we see it from the back side, say in the norma occipitalis, because the occipital bone is the main bone which is visible here. Here is the part of the temporal, the stellar process is visible here, and then the occipital bone. So here, this is the mastoid process of the temporal, a portion of the stellar process will be visible, and this is the region of the view of the skull from behind. What we did not discuss last time, this is Norma occipitalis. So now you will appreciate that the skull can be viewed from the front side, Norma frontalis. It can be viewed from the back side, Norma occipitalis. It can be viewed from right or the left side, Norma lateralis. And from the top, which we are going to discuss today, that will be Norma occipitalis. So four different views of the cranium you should keep in mind. Now, as you will appreciate, the sagittal suture is coming over here, posterior part, and there is a suture, what we discussed last time, the lambdoid suture, and the lambdoid suture is just connecting the squamous part of the occipital with the posterior end of the sagittal suture. Now, over the external aspect of the squamous part of the occipital, there is a prominent portion which you can feel your, uh, on your own skull. That is the most prominent point in the squamous part of the hospital. And since it is on the outer aspect, it is termed as external occipital protuberance. External occipital protuberance. Protuberance is any projection in the bone. The external occipital protuberance is known with its short name, the Enion. Enion is this, and extending on the side from the Enion, there are lines which are visible here. And running from the external occipital protuberance or the Enion, towards the posterior margin of the foramen magnum, which is the largest foramen in the skull, there is a bony ridge that is known as external occipital crest. So external occipital protuberance and the external occipital crest. Midway somewhere between the lines which we have drawn upwards, there are two more faint lines. They are the inferior lines par almost parallel and since the occipital bone is seen in the uppermost portion of the neck, they are called as nuchal lines. So there are two lines, they are present on the, in relation with the external occipital crest and the external occipital protuberance, these are the nuchal lines and anatomically this will be the superior nuchal line, this will be the inferior nuchal line. Now if you remember the 
superior extremity, there was a muscle on the back which you know by the name of trapezius. Trapezius muscle was there and the trapezius muscle is arising from the medial one third of the superior nuchal line. So, say here was the origin of the trapezius from the medial one third on both the sides. It was also arising from the external occipital crest, but we will not go into the detailed origin of the trapezius. What we are interested here is that from the remaining portion of the superior nuchal line, that means the lateral two thirds of the superior nuchal line, there is the muscle which is coming in our the region today that has got its origin from the lateral two-thirds of the superior nuchal line. This will be the frontooccipitalis muscle. To be more correctly, it is occipitofrontalis because its origin is from the occipital bone. So that the fibers of the of the, this has got two bellies and the occipital belly of the frontooccipitalis muscle will be arising from the lateral two-thirds of the superior nuchal line. So that is how the occipitofrontalis muscle is taking origin. And you can realize that the middle portion will be spared because trapezius is taking origin from here. So somewhere here is the external occipital protuberance and we will not draw the trapezius here just to avoid complication. Now from this occipital belly there runs the these fibers are actually attached in the aponeurosis what we have discussed at the third layer and say this is the aponeurosis. So aponeurosis is covering the top side of the skull just deep to the connective tissue which is not drawn here that will be shown in a different diagram. These are the fibers of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. Now as this aponeurosis proceeds forwards, it gets inserted into another head of the occipitofrontalis muscle that is the frontal belly. Now this frontal belly has be, will be drawn here. So the fibers of the frontal belly, they are now in contrast with the fibers of the occipital belly, the frontal belly fibers, they are converging. And as you will see when we draw the region of the face, the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis muscle, this will go and will be seen again when we pass on to the frontal view of the face that is the nerve front. So the point to remember here is that the two occipital bellies, they are separated from each other, they are widely apart in contrast to the frontal belly with the fibers of which they are converging and therefore they will reach here. Now over this region, there will be deep, uh, the two layers the skin and the connective tissue and just before we proceed further and we can just have a view of this region I can now rub off the layers here you have already noted these layers so we will try to see what happens in the region of the face now the Frontal bellies of the occipitofrontalis muscle, they can be seen when we see the face from the front side. 
Now suppose here is the region of the head and here uh, where the orbits which you saw last time, this is the medial one third of the upper margin of the orbit and the lateral two thirds and this was the portion of the bony orbit. So it is somewhat quadrangular in shape and we will leave it ourselves today only to the region of the front side of the frontal bone which in the living being forms the region of the forehead. That's why probably the name of this bone is the frontal bone. Now above the superior orbital margin there is a, a slight blunt ridge which is corresponding with the region of the eyebrows and that is termed as superciliary arch. So the frontal bellies as they are seen from this view they are converging and are inserted towards the skin of the eyebrows. So the muscle is coming from the scalp side and the two corresponding bellies they are converging. So the, uh, as they are converging there is the convergence which you can see here the frontal bellies and since they are converging there will be a pointed a portion of this aponeurosis. The aponeurosis is covering the sagittal suture also and fills the gap between the two frontal bellies. So th this tapering portion of the aponeurosis, this will be visible here. This is also coming from the region of the scalp and will be in between the two front bellies. Remember that the occipital belly of the frontal occipitalis, you have seen that it was arising from the lateral two third of the superior nuchal line. Whereas, whereas the frontal bellies, they are inserted over the skin. So there is a bony origin of the occipital bellies and a cutaneous attachment of the frontal bellies. Therefore, when the muscle will contract, it will raise the skin of the eyebrows upwards and that is will be producing some facial expression which we will talk when we reach to the region of the face. Now, once we cut a section here, passing through the middle of this portion, the region of the scalp, there will be, say, this is the skull, the two, this will be a coronal section, and say here, these are the outer tables of the parietal bones. In between the two parietal bones, there will be a suture. This suture is the sagittal suture, as you have already noted here. This is the parietal bone, and in between the outer and the inner tables of the parietal bone, there is a portion of the spongy tissue of the bone and this constitutes a portion which is called as diploe. Diploe is the spongy bony tissue in between the outer thin and inner thin tables of this region and say this will be the sagittal suture. Now from the top side towards the inner side say this is the skin of the scalp region 
deep to the skin there will be the connective tissue and deep to the connective tissue you have seen the epinalysis of the external oblique uh, sorry the occipital frontalis muscle and that is also termed by the name of galea eponeurotica galea eponeurotica is another name for the eponeurosis of the occipital frontalis muscle so there will be galea eponeurotica here and since the section is passing through the middle we will see only the galea eponeurotica here the galea eponeurotica deep to that there will be the loose connective tissue which is a very thin layer and the pericranium which is the outermost covering of the skull bones this we can just understand here this is the region of this these three layers skin superficial uh, co collective tissue and the galea protorata uh, within this bracket they are fused together surgically and they form a single layer so when the frontal occipitalis muscle contracts there is simultaneous movement or gliding of the connective tissue with the skin of this region and say so here are the hairs which are projecting from the skin the hair follicles lying in the deep portion of the skin say so these are the hairs they are now the connective tissue which was the second layer from the top that is having bands of fibrous tissue and these bands they are connected in a zigzag manner and they connect the deep layer of the skin that is the dermis with the galea ponderotica so these fibers they make a sort of the compartments uh, for these compartments they will be just passing here and there are numerous compartments and they form a sort of zigzag arrangement and they are just present deep to the skin so between the skin deep layer and the galea operatica you will appreciate that there will be such compartments in the connective tissue now within these compartments lie the blood vessels and the walls of the blood vessels they are attached or fused with the fibrous tissue of this band for the sake of simplicity i am showing only two vessels but the scalp region is having a very rich blood supply and therefore there are number of muscles so you can show the veins here which are slightly larger and the arteries besides these blood vessels this connective tissue compartments they also contain certain nerves which we will talk uh, in mo a moment so the nerves and blood vessels they are placed here in this layer the loose connective tissue is between the pericranium and the galea ponderotica and we will talk about the applied importance of this uh, slightly later on since this is the inner view of the parietal bones there will be cranial cavity and the periosteum inside the cranial cavity is also a fibrous a tough layer and that tough layer i am showing it with the same color and this is the outer layer which will cover the brain also and 
that forms therefore a layer which is termed as the dura matter dura means hard matter means substance so the dura matter is the layer which will be on the inner side so the skull bones on the outer aspect are covered by the periosteal layer known as pericranium which was the deepest layer in the region of the skull and the inner side of this will be having the dura mater now the dura mater although we will come to the details of the dura mater when we talk of the brain inside the cranial cavity but here in relation with the scalp you must understand that the dura mater consists of two layers one layer is covering the bones another layer which i i am going to show with the dotted line this is the inner layer of the dura mater and the inner layer of the dura mater is termed as the meningeal layer now at places the meningeal layer gets separated there are only two possibilities of this meningeal layer one is that it gets separated from the outer layer which is termed as endosteal layer and our sometimes at certain places which will be visible in this diagram also that these the meningeal layer or the inner layer of the dura mater is coming in close approximation now whenever there is a close approximation of the meningeal layer or the inner layer of the dura mater they fuse together and appear as a single layer but at places where they are separated from each other they form certain spaces one space you are looking here another space you are looking here and these spaces they contain the venous blood and they are the dural venous sinuses so they say so they are filled up with the blood they are not very smooth layers but there are septa and inside the, the, there are the dura vena sinuses so one dural sinus will be here and another dural sinus will be located in this space here since both of these they are just deep to the sagittal suture therefore their name you can easily understand that they will be called as the superior sagittal sinus and the inferior sagittal sinus because they are in relation with this so this is the superior sagittal sinus and this is the inferior sagittal sinus now there are in relation with these and in relation with the scalp you must understand that there are certain other veins which are present here and some veins from these sinuses they are draining the diploe diploe so these veins will be called as the diploe veins some veins they not only this but by minute perforations they are connected with the veins in the connective tissue layer of the scalp these therefore they are outside the cranial cavity and they are called as the, <laughs> the, the these were the diploe veins because they are draining the diploe the other veins which reach to the outer side they are termed as the emissary veins so these two type of veins will come in relation with this so this is 
coronal section giving you some idea about how these layers of the scalp are arranged. Now, not only this, you have also to understand that within this layer, there are, as demonstrated there, there are nerves and vessels. So, before we end for the region of the scalp, the more important portion is related with the nerves and vessels of the scalp region, which I will be dealing in another diagram for the sake of clarity. So, these nerves and vessels, they are all in relation with the connective tissue. And if I redraw this region, here was the nose visible, and say so these are the auricle, the pinna are of the external ear. I will not draw the sutures here just for the sake of clarity, but you can understand that the frontal bellies which were converging, they are seen over this region. Leaving a tapering gap between the two bellies and that was visible in the front view. There will be the epidermis of the occipital frontalis muscle which will be all visible here and the occipital bellies which were converging, rather diverging from each other because they were arising from the lateral two-thirds of the superior nuchal line, they will be widely apart. So, say these are the fibers of the occipital bellies. So, just to revise, the two frontal bellies, they are converging and the two occipital bellies, they are widely apart. Now, this region of the scalp will be richly vascular and therefore, there are number of uh, arteries which will be coming over this region for the practical purposes. There are two arteries which are coming from within the orbit and they are approaching the region of the scalp here. They give their branches. For the sake of simplicity, they are shown only on one side, but you can understand they will be bilaterally present. These are the two arteries which are coming from an artery which is supplying the brain and is sending its one of its branches to the region of the orbit where it finally divides into two arteries. One is medial and this is called as the supratrochlear artery, supratrochlear. Supra means above. Trochlea is a pulley, fibrous pulley, which is present in the bony orbit and around which some muscle, superior oblique muscle converges and changes its direction. The other artery which is coming in view is the supraorbital. And just to understand, if this is the bony orbit, the supra, somewhere here at the upper medial end of the bony orbit, there is the fibrous pulley. 
that is known as trochlea and the artery is passing from this region of the orbit in towards the forehead and curves around the scalp region that is the supratrochlear another artery which passes through the notch in the upper margin that is the supraorbital notch and this artery is the supraorbital so the supratrochlear and the supraorbital arteries they are the two arteries which are coming in the region of the scalp supratrochlear and supraorbital remember that the supratrochlear artery is located medially whereas the supraorbital artery is as lateral to the supratrochlear both of these they are branches of the internal carotid artery internal carotid internal carotid artery is supplying the brain and these two branches from the internal carotid they are coming in the region of the scalp beside these two branches there are other arteries which are present in the region of the scalp and these arteries they are the branches from a, a sister branch known as external carotid artery so the external carotid artery is having several branches external carotid and the internal carotid they are the two branches from an artery which is the common carotid and the external carotid artery is basically meant for the region of the neck and the head whereas the internal carotid artery is basically meant for the supply of the brain now external carotid gives a number of branches and those branches we shall take when we pass on to the region of the neck later on but what the arteries which come in the region of the scalp they are to be understood and these arteries three are in number they will all be branches from the external carotid one is coming just in front of the auricle this artery is passing in front of the auricle and as this region is the temporal region the artery is called as superficial temporal artery superficial temporal and the next artery which is present here is coming again to the scalp as one of the branches from the external carotid the that artery is coming behind the auricle in the scalp region and since it is coming behind the auricle its name is posterior auricular posterior auricular the third artery which is coming in this region is almost on the posterior aspect over the area containing the portion of the occipital belly and these arteries this artery is present in relation with the occipital bone and this is the occipital artery occipital so three branches are coming from the region of the 
uh, from the external carotid branch of the common carotid and thus you can see that in total these arteries are five in number two from the internal carotid supratrochlear and supraorbital and three from the region of the external carotid branch and these three arteries and branches of the external carotid and two from this they make five arteries on one side similarly the five arteries on the other side and this will make that there are the 10 arteries. So you can classify these arteries in several ways. One way of classifying is by the branches of the internal or the external carotid. Another um, way of classifying them is in front of the ear and behind the ear. So in front of the ear there are three arteries, behind the ear there are two arteries. On the other side, the same veins are present so on this side i will show the with the blue color the veins the supratrochlear vein the supraorbital vein the superficial temporal vein the posterior auricular vein and the occipital vein these veins the only thing is that the two veins which are shown near the nose and in the front region of the scalp, they are not coming from within the orbit. These veins, they remain uh, outside. They don't follow their, their counterparts uh, strictly and these are just coming here. So if you can understand with this diagram, the things will be more clear. Drawing a side view of the face. Here are the eyebrows. Here is the auricle, external ear, pinna part. Here is the lower jaw. So just the supratrochlear and the supraorbital arteries, they were coming from within the orbit and we are extending to the region of its scalp almost up to the middle. This was the supratrochlear and a little lateral to this was the supraorbital which usually divides into two branches when it reaches to the region of the scalp. So these arteries, they were coming from within the orbit as talked earlier. The corresponding veins, the supra trochlear vein, veins are relatively more superficial and the supra trochlear and the supra orbital veins they don't go inside the orbit but they join together in the region of the junction of the nose with the cheek and they are the tributaries of a vein which will pass in the region of the face and this is therefore called as the common facial vein. This vein will come here and will cross the mandible to reach in this portion. The superficial temporal vein will be somewhere here. Now the superficial temporal vein also is very important because this joins with a deep vein which is coming deep to the mandible and is the maxillary vein. So the superficial temporal and the maxillary vein, they are forming a vein 
which lies in the deep space behind the ramus of the mandible and that's why it is known as posterior facial vein because in relation with the vein earlier this is much more posterior so the posterior facial vein is here and the posterior facial vein will be in relation with the parotid gland which is not represented here and this branches are uh, rather gives rise to branches this will be an anterior division and this will be the posterior division the anterior division unites with the vein which was coming in the front region and over this side this will be here crossing the neck obliquely there is a muscle which we will talk later on this is the sternomastoid muscle and this vein which has joined with the uh, this is anterior facial vein and anterior facial vein is joining with the anterior division of the posterior facial vein which is behind the mandible and therefore is also called as retro mandibular vein retro means behind retro mandibular so retro mandibular vein anterior division this joins with the anterior facial vein to make a vein which passes deep to the anterior border of the sternomastoid muscle and makes a vein which is known as common facial so the common facial vein so remember that you are getting a num number of veins which are present in the region of its scalp in association with the face this is the common facial so anterior facial retro mandibular are the posterior facial the posterior division of the retro mandibular vein this joins with the vein which you saw here now this was the posterior facial posterior auricular vein and the posterior auricular vein will naturally pass behind the auricle so diagrammatically represented like this and this joins with the vein posterior division and this forms a vein which does not pass deep to the sternomastoid muscle but lies over its surface this will be the portion of the external jugular vein which we will come later on so let us not divert too much one more thing before we reach again to the region of the scalp that coming from this region there is a vein which passes from the deeper structures and joins over the region of the angle of mouth or near the upper lip with the anterior facial vein since it is coming from the deeper aspect this vein is called as deep facial so in relation with the face we have therefore seen quite a good number of veins here to revise anterior facial vein which was formed by the union of the supratrochlear and the supraorbital the posterior facial vein which was formed by the union of the superficial temporal and the maxillary vein and the common facial formed by the anterior division plus the anterior facial the external jugular vein is formed and the common facial vein passes deep to that so we leave here only point to remain in association with the applied part of the scalp has to be understood that this deep facial vein is in the territory of say this portion of the face where it drains here and there is a venous plexus here and through this venous plexus this vein passes deep 
into a very important sinus within the cranial cavity that will be the portion of the cavernous sinus. So what we are trying to cover in today's class is about the vessels of this region and just now we I can use this same diagram here and the same diagram can be used you can draw your um, another diagram but here say this the auricle the nomenclature of the nerves which will be there now you have to understand that the in the layers of the scalp there was a portion of the two bellies, frontal bellies and the occipital bellies of the occipitorendralis muscle. And any muscle in the body is to be supplied by a motor nerve. Motor nerves are those which supply a particular muscle. Whereas the skin over this region, not only of the scalp but also of the face, that has to be supplied by the sensory nerves. So the nerves can be understood basically into the motor nerves and the sensory nerve. So for your purpose, I will draw a dotted line here in the midline, which on one side we will show the portion of the sensory nerves, on the other side the motor nerves. The motor nerve for this region which will supply both the frontal belly as well as the occipital belly will be a branch from the facial. This will be the temporal branch of the facial. Facial nerve divides into several branches and its temporal branch is coming over this region. Whereas the posterior auricular branch of the facial, this supplies this. So both these branches, they are branches from the motor nerve that is the facial. So facial nerve is the motor nerve for the cell. Don't confuse the sensory nerves with this. And if a question comes on the nerve supply of the scalp region, you have to remember that it is not only the facial which will supply, it is supplying only the muscle part and the remaining skin region is supplied by the sensory nerve. So, to understand the nerves, say this will be a supratrochlear nerve, a supraorbital nerve. Now in front of the auricle, you saw that there was a superficial temporal artery. The nerves are slightly different names and one nerve comes a little more in front of the ear that is a branch from the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve which we commonly represent with the V2. V stands for 5 and these two branches supratrochlear and the supraorbital both are branches from the ophthalmic division which is the first division of the trigeminal nerve. The, this is nerve which is coming from the maxillary and maxillary nerve when we will talk of the face in our next class you will see that the maxillary nerve is giving one branch which is coming to the region of the scalp and the other branch will be in relation with this. This is somewhat given near the zygomatic bone where there is a small foramen. So one nerve you will find running towards the scalp region, another you will find coming towards the face region. So since the zygomatic bone is the bone which has got minute foramen through which these nerves emerge, the nerve emerging and going towards the scalp region is termed as zygomatico-temporal nerve, whereas the nerve which will run towards the face is zygomatico-facial. 
So Zygomet, this is the Zygomet called temporal branch given from the maxillary. Just in front of the auricle, there will be another important nerve which will be coming in the region of the scalp. This is from the third division of this and the third division is known as the mandibular division and the mandibular division gives rise to a branch which is termed as auriculotemporal because it is in relation with the auricle and is coming to this region so its name is auriculotemporal auriculotemporal so remember that the artery was the superficial temporal the nerve just in relation with the superficial temporal artery is not the superficial temporal nerve but the auriculotemporal nerve all these four nerves which are coming over this region they are all branches from the trigeminal behind the auricle the scalp region is supplied not by the cranial nerve but by the spinal nerves and this has to be understood that there will be a nerve which will be passing in relation with the auricle that is the great auricular nerve great auricular then there comes another nerve which is termed as the lesser occipital then the greater occipital and very close to the midline there is a nerve which is called therefore this is the, the greater occipital and this nerve is the third occipital or in relation with the lesser and the greater it is sometimes also called as least occipital nerve so you will see that in front of the auricle the scalp is supplied by the cranial nerve all branches from the divisions of the trigeminal are the fifth cranial nerve and behind the auricle there are so four nerves are situated sensory nerves of course they are situated behind the auricle and if you combine this branch there will be five nerves behind this as there were five arteries on one side there are five nerves one five nerves lying in front of the auricle and five nerves behind the auricle so behind the auricle the spinal nerves in front of the auricle the trigeminal nerve in front of the auricle four sensory and one motor nerve behind the auricle four sensory and one motor nerve so that you have to keep in mind all these nerves and vessels as talked earlier they are lying in the connective tissue now over this side one line about the applied importance because before we come to the end of today's class and that will be just the loose aerial tissue which is a layer here and over the loose aerial tissue these three superficial layers they can glide over this superficial temporal and there will be the portion so just in relation with the diagram given before there you can just keep that diagram in mind or you can draw simultaneously here this was the parietal bone having the pericranium as the outermost layer on the external aspect of the skull and the outer layer of or the endosteal layer of the dura mater both are fibrous layers and in between the sutures which were present the sagittal suture will be present here 
there are thin bands which pass through the sutures in between the two bones and this will be the portion of the this will be called as the sutural ligament here you have seen the diploe so this is the diploe and The superior seatal sinus, endosteal layer, which I showed with the dotted line. So, say this is the meningeal or the inner layer of the dura mater, which separates near the midline to form the superior seatal sinus. We limit ourselves only up to say this point. This was filled up with the venous blood, the superior seatal sinus which you have seen. And the diploic veins and the emissary veins. Superficial to the say the, this layer is the loose aerial tissue which I am just enlarging for the sake of convenience and above this were the three layers skin, superficial fascia, uh, sorry the collective tissue and the galea aponeurotica or the aponeurosis of the occipitofrontal muscle. These were the fibrous compartments lodging the nerves and vessels. Now, out of these layers, you have to understand what is their clinical significance. And as the scalp is the top portion here, there can be in injuries or blows on the scalp with either a blunt weapon or a sharp weapon. And suppose a sharp weapon is this is cutting the skin only it will cut through the not only very rarely only the skin will be cut otherwise it will cut the through the collective tissue layer which is containing the vessels here and as this is richly vascular as you have seen here 10 uh, um, the 10 arteries and the 10 veins so you can imagine that how much vascular is there one or the other vessels are liable to be cut and once the blood vessel will cut a minor cut in the skull will give rise to bleeding now this bleeding is quite profuse although it is not very deep but it is quite profuse because the fibrous compartments they are attached to the outer walls of the vessel layer and therefore they do not allow vessels to constrict. So that is a drawback and that's why uh, immediate pressure should be applied over the site of any cut so that you press the connective tissue underneath the skin or the wound and the vessels you support or assist the vessels to constrict. Now once the vessels are cut bleeding will be there and say some injury or some weapon is cutting so deep that it reaches deep to the gilia ponerotica. So wounds lying superficial and wounds passing deep will cut the gilia ponerotica also and the gilia ponerotica once it will be cut the blood which is oozing out from these cut vessels will spread out into the loose aerial tissue and loose aerial tissue will be reaching to the front side also underneath 
the frontal billy and therefore it will keep on collecting and collecting and so after a few days the patient will again approach you that around the or orbit there is the black coloration which is due to the collection of blood there and that will be when the injury or the cut reaches up to this region. A still deep thing will damage the pericranium also and this pericranium once damaged this might be more complicated and of course if it will be so much deep it may cut the whole bone here and deep to the nostril layer there are other layers of the brain as well as the brain substance so you can just imagine the complication so the different levels of cut will have different importance and these will be dealt in greater detail when we are aware of the venous sinuses in the cranial cavity and so on so just Today what you have seen the layers of the scalp, you have seen the layers in relation with the coronal section, you have understood what are the diploic veins and what are the emissary veins, you have understood that how rich is the vascular supply of the scalp region, how many nerves are there. So you can now summarize that on all each side there will be 10 vessels, 5 arteries and 5 nerves and these 8 sensory nerves and 2 motor nerves. So the skin flap, the only good thing is that the blood supply and the nerves which are coming here, they are centripetal. Because even if the scalp is removed with a flap here, the blood vessels, because they are coming from the periphery to the center, they are likely to be less damaged. And you can just stitch off the skin flap uh, to repair the gap or the wound. So I think this is sufficient for today's class. Next time we will pass further and to the region of the face and so on.